Coming up on Transformers University, the Autobots are looking for oil, and they'll try to keep the Decepticons off the pole. We're talking Ladybird books in 1987 right now on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to episode 110 of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Percali, owner, operator, madman behind TFU.info, the website, the Toy Archive, this podcast, TFU News and Views podcast, and oh, so much more. And I want to add one thing to that as well. If you've been following me on Twitter, then you've probably seen I've announced some new t-shirts available uh, to help promote Transformers University, help promote TFU.info, and allow you a chance to wear uh, some of the best moments from this podcast uh, <laughs> uh, on your body and a uh, way to celebrate uh, the way we enjoy this show. So there are three designs up right now over at tpublic.com. I'll put the link in the show notes, but uh, if you want to type it in, it's tpublic, T-E-E, public.com. Uh, slash user slash tfu info all one word and uh, you can find uh, we have our twin shirts of the red one and the blue one for the rumble and frenzy fans out there Uh, those are double-sided with uh, the rumble and frenzy uh, chest on the front and then uh, the cassette design on the back with uh, Transformers University podcast on the label. Uh, I'm actually pretty proud of that design, so please do go check it out. And then I put another one together pretty quickly after that. Uh, if you've been following our Headmasters episodes, you know that Six Shot is the evil Destron ninja consultant. So I've been able to put together a nice little shirt uh, in the uh, style of the song that I did uh, uh for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but for Evil Destron Ninja Consultants. So uh, swing on by to tpublic.com, check those out. Just remember, any shirt you buy, uh, it goes along to help the show. And now, speaking of the show, let's let's get into our episode 110. We're going to stay in Europe for this one, uh, in the UK, and cover some more Lady Bird books. So Lady Bird books went on for quite a while. Uh, they did about two a year uh, for most of G1. So we're going to cover books 8 and 9 uh, from 1987. Those are entitled Decepticons at the Pole and Autobot Strike Oil. Both are by uh, John Grant with art by Barry Rowell, who I could not really find much information on. Um so we're just going to get right into the story, and we're going to start with this introduction. Once, long ago, a race of robot beings called Autobots were forced to wage war against their evil counterparts, the Decepticons, to bring peace back to their home planet, Cybertron. When chance brought both sides to Earth, the war went on. Over many centuries, leaders have come and gone. Now the fight continues in a far-flung corner of the galaxy, on the planet Nebulos. Both Autobots and Decepticons have formed new alliances, each with a rival group of native Nebulans. The Decepticons are determined to destroy the Autobots and reign supreme. Will they succeed? The Transformers, Decepticons at the Pole. Now keep in mind, both stories do have that intro uh, where the Nebulans are treated as a a, kind of as a race of tiny robots. Uh, It's it's an interesting way to see them portrayed and we'll find that throughout the story. Now we're going to start with Decepticons at the Pole. And uh, here we find out from uh, Vorath, the Nebulan, a bit about nebulan astronomy. Unlike other planets, explained Vorath, Nebulos does not rely on solar energy. Suns rise and set. Suns can be screened by clouds. Their energy is unreliable. Nebulos's main energy source is far off on the very edge of our galaxy. It is a star, a pulsar, which sends out a steady stream of cosmic radiation. By a fluke of intergalactic gravitation, most of this radiation is intercepted by Nebulos. Its greatest concentration is in our north polar region. What happens then? asked Cyclonus. Nebulos's magnetic field forms a network of force lines. The cosmic energy is guided by these to every part of the planet. 
So make what you will of the science behind that. But uh, I do find it funny that uh, throughout this audio uh, recording of the book, uh, the planet is referred to as Nebulos, uh, as opposed to Nebulos or Nebulos, uh, Nebulos. Uh, and ultimately, the Decepticons plan to tap the pole. Uh, Aimless designs a giant tetrahedron uh, to construct the pole, and the Decepticons, they start to build. Uh, the Autobots, they, they get wise to the game, but uh, not sure what the uh, tetrahedron is. So Hot Rod asks his Nebulan partner, Firebolt, right? Hot Rod asked his Nebulan companion, Sparks, what it might mean. I guess that it is a piece of pyramid energy technology. From its location, I would say that the Decepticons plan to intercept the energy flow from space. But that would be a disaster for the Autobots, cried Hot Rod. Not only for the Autobots, said Sparks, but also for Nebulos. Without a steady flow of cosmic energy, the planet will die. So that you have it, if the energy gets tapped, Nebulos will die. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, they use the name Sparks here for for the target master partner, which is, isn't normally, and that's in fact was a working name for Firebolt, uh, and I believe it made it into the Marvel comics at one point as well. Um, from here, Hot Rod uh, gives Cyclonus a call and tells him what he's about to do, and he doesn't believe him, doesn't really care. The Decepticons proceed on their plan and build the Tetrahedron. Uh, the Autobots head over there at night and attack the Tetrahedron. Uh, and there's some neat art here with Brainstorm being drawn with his weapons pegs on his guns. As the Autobots attack, uh, the small Nebulans uh, sneak in with explosives uh, so that they can uh, sabotage the Tetrahedron. The Autobots retreat, and later the bombs go off and the Tetrahedron is destroyed. Scourge reports to Cyclonus about the destruction of the Tetrahedron, and Cyclonus has a plan. We will start again said Cyclonus. You, Aimless, will come up with a design that is not so easily destroyed. Scourge, you will be responsible for its protection. I have an idea which will guarantee that, said Scourge. Instead of a guard of miserable idiots, I suggest that the entire Decepticon force be used. Move everyone to the pole, said Cyclonus. Activate Scorponok, said Scourge. Move the whole base to the pole. I find it interesting here. It's activate Scorponok. Scorponok is treated uh, much less like a character, more like a uh, city and more like just an object. So what the Decepticons do is they bring Scorponok up towards the uh, pole and they build a new energy interceptor uh, around him. Uh, and this involves a base that has these three domes. And uh, the Autobots, they develop uh, a new plan. Uh, they attack and uh, to draw the fire and then uh, sure shot cup and blur are sent to the domes they fire at the ground underneath the domes melting the ice and making the domes collapse in on themselves then they fire on the energy reservoirs and scorpion collapses and then tries to transform and the decepticons are stuck trying to free him so seeing this the autobots Look on. I feel that we really ought to offer our help, said Hot Rod. On the other hand, I think that this could keep the Decepticons usefully occupied for some time. <laughs> I think you are probably right, said Cop. We would probably only get in the way. I suggest we go home. It's been a busy day. And turning their backs on the wreckage of the Decepticon energy interceptor and the bogged down Scorponok, the Autobots transformed and set off on the long haul back to base. And so that wraps up the first story we are covering here in this episode. Uh, I got to say it's my first experience with the story. And I don't know, it didn't it didn't um I I think I had higher hopes for it uh because it had so many characters from the 87 series which we haven't really uh, gotten to see in this um in 1987, right? So like it's kind of cool to see stories from 1987 featuring characters from 1987 not say something modern where they've uh, you know introduced old characters into a, some sort of nostalgia setting but um seeing it in the original context and uh, i don't know i guess part of me kind of had higher hopes for this uh this story uh given how uh, cool the artwork is on the cover of the book 
all in all, uh, still an entertaining bit of Transformers history. And we're going to move on to the next story right after this. Hey, want to help out this podcast or the website tfu.info? There's a number of ways you can do it. Let me tell you how. You can help us directly by joining our Patreon and enrolling as a student at Transformers University. There, you'll get early access to the podcast as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes peaks and perks for as little as $1 a month. Sign up is quick and easy. Just swing on by to www.patreon.com slash tfuinfo. Another way you can help us is by using our Amazon link, www.tfu.info slash Amazon. Type that into your browser whenever you want to shop at Amazon and a portion of what you spend will be contributed back to us. It's that easy. Finally, you don't become the world's longest running transforming toy archive without some help from other fans. We're always on the hunt for photos of figures and accessories we're missing from our pages. If you'd like to contribute, go to tfu.info slash help for a list of what we need or send an email to info at tfu.info. tfu.info, the alpha trion and omega prime of transforming toys. Now, back to the show. And so, the next book, Autobots Strike Oil, begins with Cup telling Hot Rod they are running low on lubricants. Uh, there's a big emphasis on finding lubricants for the Autobots here. And uh, much like the previous story, the Nebulons are there to provide some context and some history. And this will come from Cup's target master partner, Recoil. When I was young, he said, the old Nebulons spoke of a great lake of oil. It was more than enough for our needs. It lay among jagged mountains and stretched as far as the eye could see. Then there was a terrible earthquake. Great areas of Nebulos were totally destroyed, but worse still, huge cracks appeared in the ground. The cracks ran right across the bed of the lake. In almost less time than it takes to tell, the oil had drained away. Now, there is only a vast, barren valley where it used to be. We Nebulans have always believed that somewhere beneath the surface of our planet are great oil deposits, but our technology has never been equal to the task of recovering it. You know, the cool thing about both of these books, uh, and I know I just spent the last 30 seconds saying how the other one was a little disappointing. The cool thing I do like about these books is getting the bits of Nebulan history, uh, even though the, this instance has the Nebulans as as a race of robot beings. Um, and there's some very interesting bits in this particular book uh, regarding that, uh, particularly the lake of oil and how the nebulans need less oil uh than the much larger autobots uh so the autobots they want to find this uh hidden underground buried lake of oil so they send chrome dome and hardhead out on a scouting mission with chrome dome and hardhead go stylor and duros their headmaster partners and they uh they hop out and they start looking around now, while they hop out and look around, Chrome Dome and Hardhead decide to transform into robot modes and uh, just hang out without their heads. And they're drawn that way. Uh, it's a bizarre image. Uh, I don't think you'll find many images of the Headmasters without their heads actually like trying to do things. Uh, ultimately, Duros finds uh, an entrance and Hardhead transforms into his tank mode and helps to open it. It's there, said Hardhead. But we don't want to blast away the rock and set the oil on fire at the same time. This isn't a job for a laser cannon. Switch off audio sensors, everybody! Here goes! Hardhead swiveled his main cannon barrel towards the side of the hill. Then he loosed a stream of sonic shell fire. The powerful sound energy released by the shells blasted the rock to powder, forming a circular hole in the side of the hill. The hole became deeper and deeper. Hardhead stopped firing. Have a look, Duros, he said. So a couple of things I found interesting of note in here. One, <laughs> uh, the pronunciation of Duros as Duros. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'm doing it wrong or it's a European thing. But uh, now, now I want to kind of uh, turn Duros into a member of Rammstein. Du, Duros. Duros Mish. <laughs> Dude, no. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, 
the other thing to note here is they talk about how Hardhead swings around his main cannon, which you would think is the um, the giant weapon that becomes his shoulder gun and the front of his turret. Uh, but the artwork uh, shows that, but doesn't show that swinging around, and in fact shows the um, the toy's handheld weapon, uh, which attaches to the top of the canopy in the toy, uh, swinging around and projecting the. Um, uh, the sonic blast to uh, create that opening. So interesting piece of artwork, interesting use of uh, the toyetic version of the art to uh, kind of play along with the story. Now the Autobots end up finding uh, this lake and decide they're going to build a hidden pipeline. Now Decepticon Recon uh, finds part of the pipeline eventually and destroys it. So the Autobots send Cup and Hybro out to repair. Cup makes the repair and then brings down part of a ravine onto it uh, to hide the pipe, and then the Autobots retreat. Now, as they retreat, Highbrow does some recon. The two Autobots had just turned away from the ravine when Highbrow held up his hand. What's that? He said. My audio sensors have picked up something. But before he could utter another word, there was a roar of engines and shots flew around the Autobots. In a cloud of dust, a Decepticon fighting patrol was approaching on the far side of the ravine. Cup and Highbrow dived for cover and returned the fire. How many are there? Asked Cup. My infrared sensors say three, but there are at least another two coming up fast. May I suggest a maximum velocity retrogression? Said Highbrow. You mean retreat as fast as we can? You're right. Let's move. Ducking and weaving, keeping under cover, the Autobots scrambled along. They came to the foot of a small mountain and rested in a shallow gully. There was no sign of the Decepticons. We've given them the slip, said Cup. Yes, said Highbrow. We were lucky. None of them was a flyer, and the ravine would take them some time to cross. Now, that's a fun bit of things that don't line up. Um, Highbrow mentions how the Decepticons do not have any flyers. However, uh, the art shows Scourge uh, driving around the desert in his um, in his sweeper Scourge mode. Um so it, it's it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, I guess the toy had wheels, right? So um, I guess the artist took this as uh, some sort of pointy triangular car. Now the bots, the Autobots, they need to escape and they need to cross open desert to do it to get around uh, the Decepticons. In the desert, uh, the Autobots encounter what is referred to as magnetic dust. Uh, it's almost like quicksand, and it's kind of a neat concept in terms of Transformers. So this magnetic dust um, weighs down the Autobots and keeps them from uh, getting out of the sand. Uh, Highbrow beats it by reversing polarities. I'm not sure why Cup didn't do this. He's very familiar with it. Up like the Shrike Bats of Dramadon. How'd you beat them? I'm trying to remember. There were an awful lot of casualties that day. Oh, yeah, we invaded polarities. So as Cup gets weighed down uh, and becomes another one of his own war stories, Highbrow flies, uh, flies out and finds Crosshairs while Cup is still trapped. Crosshairs says high impact can also reverse the effects of magnetic dust and fires a grenade right next to cup i don't know how safe that is but that's what he did and uh it frees cup for enough for highbrow to lift him to safety uh the decepticons spot the autobots but the autobots give them the slip and that wraps up this particular ladybird story i know what i liked this one better than than decepticons at the pole uh it was it, it was a bit more interesting in terms of concepts now the story is a bit disjointed uh there's a lot of time spent on the autobots just trying to escape and get out of their own way um but they end up getting the oil they end up getting the underground pipeline decepticons are not smart enough to figure out that that pipe might lead somewhere and uh that's how the story goes uh uh it's a fun little story another one with with some interesting art some interesting characterization worth um hunting down the audio if you can uh for both of these um, I'm not sure they're up anywhere, and if they are, the uh, one place I know the audio might be uh, is not someone I would refer you to go to. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to take a look and see maybe about putting this up on YouTube for, for everyone if I have a little time to do some edits. 
thanks for listening to the show. Stick around to hear what's coming up next episode. But first, I want to fill you in on a few ways you can stay in touch with the show. Want to be on the show? Leave us a voicemail at 702-763-4838. That's 702-POD-4TFU. Or send an email to info at tfu.info. Be sure to catch us on Twitter at TFU underscore info and on Facebook and Instagram under the username TFU info, all one word. Also, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash TFU info, where we post all of our podcasts plus special video segments, reviews, and live coverage of Transformers related events such as New York Toy Fair and New York Comic Con. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit us at www.tfu.info, the world's longest-running transforming toy archive. And that will wrap up this edition of Transformers University. Once again, don't forget to check out my Tee Public store. That is Tee Public, T E E P U B L I C T Public dot com slash user slash T F U I N F O. That's tfu info uh i'll take you right to the store i've got three shirts up there right now uh the red one the blue one and evil destron ninja consultant um so please swing by if if you aren't helping the show out uh using patreon uh it's a good way to not only show your support but get something back uh so something you can wear every day you can wear you know if you don't want to wear it out, you can use it to wash your car. Uh, there's also other merch there, phone cases and stickers and buttons, pins, uh, hoodies, all sorts of things you can do with, with some of those designs. So all the proceeds go here back into Transformers University, into TFU.info and into uh, all the content we provide here. So with that in mind, I want to thank you once again for joining the show. Coming up next time on Transformers University. We're going to stay in Europe a little bit longer. We've got a few more episodes where I think we're going to stick around uh, the European continent. And uh, for episode 111, we're going to talk about the European toy line in 1987. Um, what came out there? What didn't come out there? What came out later there than, say, 1986 when, when some of the things came out in uh, North America? Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some interesting Italian Transformers names and what they translate to. And uh, just talk a little bit about the 1987 Toy Line for Europe. So until next time, I am your host, Anthony Bercali, owner, operator, Madman, behind TFU.info. See ya.